Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Welcome, Walter. Welcome, Martin. Are you doing well? Yes. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Before we begin, we've mentioned in a previous What's Up Prof a while back that we were doing a, a series on Hebrews. Yes. And I think it's important that we let the viewers know it's already started previous Friday, and we encourage you to go and have a look at the series that will be airing every Friday at 6 o'clock South African time. Particularly in a time when the world is rapidly moving into a system of apostasy which is incomprehensible and where Jesus Christ is being marginalized more and more. I think it's essential in this time that we put an emphasis on the exact position of the Redeemer, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. And that is why we have decided to do a study on the book of Hebrews. No, thank you very much for that study. And we, we thank God for allowing you to do it. And with that, let's put Jesus first in this discussion. Of course, it will be important to have him here with us. I do, wouldn't want to be without him now. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we have such an important discussion to do, and we cannot do this without you. So we ask that you please enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit and be present here to guide our, our thoughts and discussion. In Jesus' name, Amen. Martin, as we said just now when we spoke about the book of Hebrews, the world has managed to put a great gulf between truth and what the world presents mm -hmm. as truth. And it has succeeded in ridiculing the word of God to such an extent that it is regarded as a storybook of allegories yeah. rather than historic realities. Now, you know, when the world and the Bible come into conflict, mm -hmm. it seems to me that the world wants to run with the science. But we've spoken about science falsely so-called before, right? Correct, yeah. Now, just because the world says something and just because eminent scientists say something doesn't mean that it is so. Because yeah. everything is wrapped up in theories. And a theory is not a fact. No. Right? We've discussed this many times. No matter how you look at it, uh, the world of science is not going to be in harmony with the book of Genesis. No. And there's a decision to be made. Do we believe what the Bible says or don't we? Now, not only the Bible, when we come to the spirit of prophecy, how far will we go? Yeah. So we've titled this one, The Church in Crisis. Questions on the state of things. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to look at some questions and then we'll try and answer those questions and we will see that many of the questions bring us into direct conflict with the worldview. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the Bible says that even the elect will be deceived. Yeah. So if we do not cling to the truths that have been revealed in the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, then we can be led to compromises or even to a total rejection of the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. It's so dangerous because if you decide that, or not decide, the Bible says, like we've mentioned before, the Word is truth. Yes. So then it means the whole Word is truth. Yes. There's nothing, there's no lie in there. So now you have to put your trust completely from Genesis 1 till Revelation 22. Correct. And here's another important point. When the world starts ridiculing mm. what the Word of God says, on whatever issue, whether it is the historic origin, mm -hmm. whether it is the historic history of the unfolding of the events, Whatever topic, whether it is health, whether it is mm -hmm. salvation, 
when the world starts ridiculing and the church accepts some of the premises of the world, mm -hmm. that's when we have a crisis Correct. in the church. Mm -hmm. So shall we ask some questions? Yes, let's. So basically this is, this is a whole talk on questions, right? Correct. It's not a normal questions and answer like no, usual. No, no. This is. These are questions. So Martin, let us start gently and ask the first question and then we'll build up as we go along. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, are we involved in a battle between good and evil, truth and error? Without a question. So there, there is no doubt that we are involved in a battle between good and evil. The Bible describes such a battle, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it gives us the origin of this battle. And there are many that even deny the very existence of the other realm, the realm of evil, mm -hmm. the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been involved in occultism in my life, and so I know that this is a reality. Strange. Even when I was an atheist, I was involved in the occult realm. That's strange, because... They actually, you actually deny any sports, um, form of it, yes. but you're involved in it. Correct. So this is an absolute oxymoron, mm. but this is the way it is. So there is a battle between good and evil and truth and error, right? Mm. We go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. We read, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So number one, we see here that she saw that the tree was good for food, even though it had been declared an evil. It was not the fruit that was bad, it was the consequences mm -hmm. of the disbelief in what God had said that was bad, right? Yeah. So if you do not believe God's word, you question it. You don't only question it, you put it to the test and go against it. Then uh, you become wise in your own eyes. Mm. And she partook and her husband partook and the rest is history, right? Correct. So that's the origin. So the basic origin is distrust in the Word of God. That's where it all starts. That's where it starts. Genesis chapter 4 verse 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Now I put that verse in there because this is the consequence. Right? That's exactly what happens. So how heavy is this conflict between good and evil yeah. to the point of death? Correct. That's, that's the outcome. That's the outcome. So these two parties, those that stand for truth and those that imbibe error, will be there to the close of time. Now the trouble is, when there's doubt about what God has said, creeps even into the church, mm -hmm. then the conflict doesn't only rage between the church and the world, but the conflict rages within the church. Mm -hmm. Do we see that? Mm -hmm. Yes, right? Unfortunately, that's yes. what's happening. Or well, some people may pay lip service to the truth, mm -hmm. but deny it in their actions. Right? That's why you know them by their fruits. Okay, so no matter what we do, we will not be able to avoid conflict. No. And in the end, this conflict rages in the world, this conflict rages in the church, and it brings us to a position where each one individually has to make a choice. Mm. And if you stand for the one, you will be lambasted by your brother. Yeah. That's a promise. That's the way it is, mm -hmm. right? It's a very sad state of affairs. 
All right, having established that, let's ask another question. If evil exists today, where, according to the scriptures, will it manifest itself? And do the scriptures warn against specific organizations where it might manifest itself? Yes. So the Bible is full of warnings. And it also gives you details. All right. So it has historic warnings for mm -hmm. the then time people of God. It has prophetic warnings for the end time people of God and everything in between. Yes. All right. So the scriptures will tell us where we can find evil. And the scriptures will warn us against specific organizations that are the harborers, the custodians, as it were, of evil. Correct? Yeah. Now, if we believe the scriptures, then even though the facade of these organizations might look good, mm -hmm. you will have to look behind the scenes because scripture has revealed them as evil. And then you will find the evil. Correct? That's 100% because, like you just said, sometimes it looks like, and even the name of the organization portrays it to be godly. Yes. But if the Bible already told you there's it's something amiss, yes. you have to go and look deeper. Okay. So we've established... There is a battle between good and evil. We've established uh, that we can find evil in the world and the Bible has given us a definition of what unrighteousness is and where we will find it. And we can therefore discern where this battle will rage and be forewarned. Okay. Let's have a look at that. So can we say that where sin the transgression of the law abounds, there we will find evil. Yes. Right? Because mm -hmm. the Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. Uh, so when you have uh, individuals or organizations that blatantly trample on the law of God, uh, we may know that that is where evil abounds. Mm -hmm. Now, Martin, on how many of the laws do they need to trample in order for us to be warned that there is evil involved? Only one. Uh -huh. Because if you transgress one, you transgress them all, right? So it should be possible to discern whether an organization or an individual is in harmony with the Word of God, yes or no, right? Yes, mm, definitely, because the Bible gives you the guideline. Okay. So wherever the transgression of the law abounds, even if it is the transgression of one of the laws, then we might know that there is evil involved. right? Now, what if the laws, even of the land, protect the evil? It doesn't make it right. Uh, then it just uh, encourages the evil, right? Yep. All right. The Bible also warns against the beast and against the image of the beast and against the dragon as particular organizational structures that will be involved in the transgression of God's law. To such a point that the Bible warns against them. Revelation chapter 16 verse 13 says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs came out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, Martin, I don't think it is for nothing that the Bible identifies the three components mm. of Babylon here. Now, who's the dragon? The dragon is the devil. Mm. He's Satan, right? So does the dragon speak through organizations that are affiliated with the beast and the false prophet? Yes. So can to. we find an occult agenda associated with the beast and the false prophet? Yep. Now, Martin, if you deny that there is an mm. occult agenda attached to the beast, 
and attached or associated with the false prophet, then you are denying the occult connection mm -hmm. to the devil himself. Yes, you're denying the truth. All right. Now, if you're going to deceive humanity, then you have to put a fair face in front, right? Of course, because you have to get the attention away. Okay. So, Martin, can we expect that the beast, which we know is Catholicism, will put a fair front towards the world? Absolutely. And can we expect that the false prophet that does his bidding and speaks on his behalf will have a fair front, mm -hmm. uh, a lamb-like front, right? But is it possible that both of them could be associated with the dragon? I don't think it's even possible. It has to be like that. All right. Can I ask another question? Mm -hmm. Seeing that we're in the question mode, uh, which of the three will be in secret? The dragon. The dragon will operate in secret. But he will be very powerfully associated with the beast and with the false prophet because they are speaking out of one mouth. Yes, because the beast and the false prophet has a face of Christianity. Correct. And the dragon is working in secret behind them. He's working in secret behind the scenes. Okay. Now, Martin, is it also possible, do you think, that if you expose this dragon component, as associated with the beast and the false prophet, that people will shout conspiracy. Mm. Yep. Possible, right? Yes. All right, so we've been warned about these organizations, the beast organization, the image of the beast organization, and the dragon organization. Now, do we find them? That is the next question. And is the church even deceived when it comes to the activities of these components and how they are interconnected. That's why the Bible warns that even the elect can be deceived. That brings us to the third question. If good exists, then where will we find it? Where the law is being kept. Where the truth abounds. Okay, so obviously the opposite of evil, right? Yes. So can we say that we will find it wherever God's word is honored and the law obeyed? Exactly. How much of the law? All of the law. All of the law. Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The law there is the Torah, it's the Bible. Mm -hmm. The testimony is what the prophets have testified. So if it's not in harmony with Scripture, then there's no light, right? Let's see if we can find the same thing in, in the New Testament. Revelation 1.9, I, John, who also am your brother and a companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. Why? For two reasons. Mm -hmm. For the word of God, mm -hmm. which is the law. Yes. And for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he believed everything that the scripture said. Yeah. So you've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. Testifying to the same thing. All right. So we have this contrast in the Bible. We know that there is evil and that there's a conflict between good and evil symbolized by Cain and Abel. We know that there are organizations that will have a front of Christianity mm -hmm. and seem to be in support of the Word of God. In fact, make a big show of being in, in harmony with the Word of God. But they violate all the principles and they are in league with the dragon. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important issue. We need to understand well, this that is a there life is a and death issue like we saw in the beginning. Correct. Eventually it will lead to death. Yes. So that brings us to the fourth question. What is the difference between 
of the world and in the world. Because this is something that Jesus talks about, you know, in a very, very succinct way. Yeah. And he makes a very distinct difference. So we have to be able to discern who is of the world and in the world, but not necessarily of the world, yes. right? So let's look at that and see if we can discern something. If we were of the world, says John 15 verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Now, that's a very interesting statement. So if you want to determine who is of the world and who is in the world, but not necessarily of the world, could we say that if the world loves you and raves about you, then you're probably in trouble? Yeah. That's exactly how, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So if you look at the great heroes in the world, the great stars mm -hmm. of the world, mm -hmm. the popular people in the world, the mega uh, rich in the world, yeah. uh, that could be a problem, right? I think it can even go further than that. Isn't it can go into his institutions, even Christian in institutions, if uh, the world love you. But if you meet in a little dungeon somewhere, you, you might be on the right side, right? Okay, let's see if we can find some more information. John 17, verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Well, here's another very interesting point. I've given them thy word. That is the law and the testimony. Yep. And if you have them, and you live according to them, what will be the consequence? The world will hate you. The world will hate you. Isn't that strange, Martin? Yeah. Do you think that this could even happen within the church? Yes. It can be also that you want popularity with the world, so... You do certain things to be accepted, but unfortunately you don't realize that you are On the wrong going side. the wrong way. Okay. So this is, this is very interesting. Let's have a look at another verse, John 17, verse 15. And I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. So we know there's evil. Mm -hmm. We know it's raging. We know that there are organizations which are defined as being run by unclean spirits that have front organizations and secret operations of which nobody wants to hear. But they are basically fighting against God's word and against God's law. And if you are for God's word and for God's law, then the world will hate you. That's it's a it. given. That's it. Right? Okay. That brings us to the fifth question. Where and with whom do the kings of the world stand in this conflict? Also now, with the dragon. Okay. And with the beast, right? And with the beast. And with the false prophet. Now, Martin, this is a very serious, serious question because, you know, the kings of the world have been given authority. Mm. But the authority is restricted. The authority may not encroach upon authority over the Word of God. Right? Yes. So when it comes to obeying the kings of the world, uh, the Bible makes it very clear that it is only insofar as they do not curtail you when it comes to obedience to God. Right? Yes, But the Bible is also very clear as to where the kings of the world stand in this conflict. So let's just make sure of that. Yeah. Revelation 17 verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, 
I will show unto thee the judgment of the great hall that sitteth upon many waters. In other words, that apostate church that sits on many nations. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. That's pretty clear. That's it. So on whose side are the kings of the world? On the side of the word of God and the testimony or on the side of the, the, the beast? The beast. Okay. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of our fornication. So it seems to me that the inhabitants of the earth are victims here. Mm -hmm. because they've been made drunk by false doctrines of her apostasy, which she peddles mm -hmm. as faithfulness. That's it. Right? Yeah. Now, we showed in the last one that the Pope clearly said, you may preach Jesus, but you may not keep the truth. Yeah. And if you want to keep the commandments, then you are not with Jesus. Well, what Jesus does he have? Because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing, right? It is amazing. But the Bible is very clear that the kings of the earth are not on the right side of this conflict. No. They're on the wrong side. Mm -hmm. So when I look at what the kings of the earth commission, should I be very careful and hesitant before yes. I go along with them? Definitely. You have to be so on your guard with God's help because, like we mentioned earlier, the dragon will be sitting behind this in secret. So render unto Caesar what is mm -hmm. due unto yeah. him, but unto God what is due mm -hmm. unto him. And if the two are in conflict, if they prevent you from doing what is due unto God, then you have to choose God. Mm -hmm. It is expedient, right? That we should obey God rather than man. The Bible is very clear on that issue. And the kings of the world are definitely, according to Scripture, not on the right side of the conflict. No. Revelation 13 verse 3 says, And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. It seems to me that the conflict is loaded <laughs> fortified on one side of the conflict. That's it. Because and that word all is quite encapsulating. That's a, it's a very serious word. So I think we've come to the conclusion that the kings of the world are on the wrong side of the issue, that we have to be very careful mm -hmm. when we look at decrees and laws emanating from the kings of the world. And we also have to look at the world and say, there is a major problem here. Yes, and you have to say, I don't want to be of the world. Good, that brings us to another question. And now we're getting into dangerous territory again. Is this a never-ending conflict, or has God set a time limit to the rule of sin? In the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, he has shown us that there's a time limit. There will be a judgment, and it will come, Correct. and it will not tarry. No. The Bible is clear on that. And the spirit of prophecy says the same thing, a time which God has fixed. That's it. All right? So if we study the word and we study the testimony, we should be able to get some idea as to what this time frame is. And uh, I know that we are on dangerous ground here because this seems to be quite a bone of contention because science is in serious conflict with the word and the testimony when it comes to the issue yeah. of time. It's actually right. interesting. The very first chapter of the Bible already starts conflict correct because if you don't trust the first chapter of the bible you know how can you trust the rest i wonder you know i also am so surprised that the, the manuscripts which roman catholicism used mm -hmm. to substantiate modern translations they don't even contain <laughs> the first chapters of 
of Genesis and they don't even contain the book of Revelation. Revelation. They don't have the beginning nor have the end. They have nothing about the Alpha and the Omega, therefore. Correct. And so they glean the rest from a handful of uncles and documents which they dig up out of desert sand to substantiate their view, right? If the Bible says to the law and to the testimony, and that constitutes the word, it has, it's of utmost important that it's the correct word. Correct, absolutely. All right, so it's not an ever, never-ending conflict. Otherwise, you know, existence would be an eternal misery. It's going to come to an end. Now, what is the time limit that God has set? Let's read it. This comes from Adventist Home, and it reads, The great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. All that was lost by sin is restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed to be the eternal abode of the obedient. For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. Now God's original purpose in its creation is accomplished. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Now, this statement will cause controversy in the world it's not in harmony with the science that the world propagates. Mm -hmm. And it seems to create consternation in the church as well. Because there are people that will say 6,000 years, that must be allegorical. Mm. It cannot be a fixed number. In fact, this here, this statement refers to a time after the millennium. And it refers to the time that Satan has to war against God's government. Yes. And that total time is 6,000 years, according to the statement. Yes, because otherwise, if it was an allegory, it would have said for thousands of years. Correct. So now, does the church still believe this, Martin? Unfortunately, no. And the majority don't. The majority don't believe it. So is there even a war raging? between what the testimonies say in this particular instance and how the church in many instances wishes to interpret it. Yes. Now, you know, Martin, I find it interesting that many, even within the church, have no qualm with saying, in six days the Lord created. Mm -hmm. But if you want to put that little word in that sentence which says literal, in six literal days mm -hmm. God created, then there's a war. Yeah. Because they want it to be allegorical. They want it to be... Of the world. Of the world. But this is pretty definitive. Yes. Now, we've spoken about it before, and there was quite a bit of consternation. But there is a time frame which God has fixed. Mm -hmm. Now, we also said that God can lengthen the days or can shorten the days. So let's just reiterate that again. But there is a time frame. Yes, he's and that time frame is in harmony with the scriptures. Definitely. Now, it's also interesting that it's only in harmony with the scriptures if you use the right manuscripts, like the Masoretic text, once you start using manuscripts like the Alex, for example, uh, then there is no harmony in terms of the ages. Then that must conclude that if you go to the Word of God, you have to go to the right manuscripts. And can we also conclude that the Word and the testimony must be in harmony with each other? Oh, definitely. All right, so let's not belabor the point any further, except to say that if you want to believe, even end up on the Isle of Patmos for the Word of God and the testimony, then you could get into trouble here, right? Well, the Bible says it will happen. I find it interesting. Mm -hmm. I come from the world where I believed in billions of years, right? And I was an evolutionist, as everybody at nausea knows now already. And uh, 
the more I've studied it, the more I've come to the conclusion that I can trust the Word of God. And I've had discussions with some of our own geologists within the church. And they will not, many of them, some of them will, but many of them won't, except 6,000 years. It find, I find it strange that they're happy to maybe accept 10,000. 10, Why not six? Some of them are happy to accept 100,000. Mm. And some of them are just way off the bat and believe in billions of years. And uh, that is quite a large proportion that actually believes what the world has said. Mm. So uh, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, they have no light in them. Mm. So I must conclude from that statement that there are many in the church that on this issue mm -hmm. have no light in them. Hmm? Yes. I actually said to one, you know, if you believe in 10,000, you will be ridiculed by the world. Yeah. And if you believe in 10,000, you're not in harmony with the word or the spirit of prophecy either, right? You're not in yeah, harmony so with the testimony or the word. You're in the middle. Of nothing. You're sitting between two chairs. So if you're going to make a fool of yourself for God, then at least go and sit on the chair <laughs> that he recommends, right? Yep. All right, so this is a very interesting point. And it's very important, Martin. Let me tell you why. Because if you believe that it's not 6,000 that has been allocated, if you believe it's 10,000, then can you postpone the coming of Christ? Indefinitely. Indefinitely. Mm -hmm. You can make it 10,500, you can make it 11, and you can work your way up through to the 100,000 and eventually to the millions if you want to, right? Yeah. Okay. But if you really believe this, and you do a little calculation, which we won't do now, then how close are we to the coming of Christ? Exactly as close as he said it would be. Thank you for that answer. I think that is pretty good. Let's leave it at that. So let's not quite leave it at that. <laughs> let's ask another question. If you believe that, if you really believe it, mm -hmm. what will that mean in terms of complacency about the coming of Christ? You won't be sitting and not doing anything. You will believe that the time is imminent, right? And do you think that you might look at events, current events, mm -hmm. in the light of a very soon coming of Christ? You will be scrutinizing the signs. You must scrutinize because you know mm -hmm. that the time is short. short. Mm -hmm. How short? Very, Very short. Even at the door. Even at the door. So can you see why this is an important point? But, but let's leave it at that. Let's not belabor it anymore. Just throw it out there and think about it. Shall we ask another question? Yes. Question number seven. If this is so, and there is a time limit, then where are we in the stream of time? We've actually answered, answered it, it, right? Mm -hmm. Then we must be at the door. Yes. That must mean that the prophetic events unfolding before our eyes must be associated with the time frame involved. Nothing that happens now is by chance and separate it from anything else. Correct. So if you believe the Bible and the spirit of prophecy on this point, and you do not want to allegorize it, then you will have your antennas upright and absorbing every bit of information and saying, we have to warn the world, the time is at hand. Mm -hmm. If we read a statement in the book Child Guidance, it says, we cannot afford to live with no reference to the day of judgment. For though long delayed, it is now near, even at the door, and hasten us greatly. The trumpet of the archangel will soon startle the living and wake the dead. This must be our attitude. Yeah. And unfortunately, 
I don't see this attitude within our ranks. And therefore, we have titled this presentation A Crisis in the Church. Great. Great. All right, Martin. Questions can be <laughs> very unnerving, right? So but, but questions let you think for yourself. That's what we have to do. We have to ask questions. Because if you just put statements out there, then it's people saying you said it. Yes. So, you know, in any teaching profession, and I've been in the teaching profession for most of my life, uh, just providing information doesn't create thinking people. Mm. No. Asking the questions and trying to get the answers makes thinking people. That's it. So let's ask another question. Question number eight. Can we thus expect the fulfillment of unfulfilled prophecy to be imminent? The Bible says so. It has to happen. So people that say that what is happening in the world now is just a glitch on the horizon and it will pass by and we'll go back to normal, don't believe the prophetic time frame. No. Right? <laughs> They don't know. They don't believe it. Yeah. Or at least I must assume they don't believe it. Or they allegorize it away. But it doesn't believe specifically what the word and the testimony says on the issue. And just another thing on this that you mentioned earlier, normal, going back to normal. If you go back 150 years, normal was different then than it was now. Isn't it? That we well, used to have before this whole episode. Correct. We are living in a so new normal. who says that that was normal three years ago? All right. It's just normal for your time frame. So when we, you can't go back to something if prophecy is keeping on fulfilling. So our line of thought will then have to answer this question. So we can expect unfulfilled prophecy to be imminently fulfilled, right? So will that make you look at the news and at the events in a different light? It has to. Will you war against it or will you say, brothers and sisters, this is a very serious issue. Time's up. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Anybody who watches the news can see that. Plagues and judgments are already falling upon the despisers of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war are portentous. They forecast the approaching events of the greatest magnitude. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating they are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be rapid ones. What do you do with that? If you don't believe in the prophetic fulfillment, then you have excuses or explanations for all of this happening. Okay. But we've highlighted a certain section here. The agencies of evil, we've already determined where the evil is, right? Yes. Because the Bible tells us, mm -hmm. are combining their forces. Now, we know that Babylon consists of three components. And the agencies of evil are combining their forces. That means that the dragon component, mm -hmm. the beast component, and the false prophet component behind the scenes are combining their forces. Yeah. Why? And they are consolidating. Why are they doing it? They're strengthening for the last great crisis. That's it. That's what they're doing, right? And then we'll see great changes. There will be a new normal, right? Yes. And the final movements will be rapid ones because we are operating in a time frame which tells us there's not much time to do this, right? Have great changes taken place in the world as of late? <laughs> stupendous changes. Have we seen rapid movements? Very rapid okay. movements. 
And we've seen them on a universal scale, and that's always a very important clue. Have we seen flip-flopping, saying this a few months ago, changing your mind at the end? Correct. In these consolidated forces? Absolutely. All right, let's have a look at this, because this is another big bone of contention, even within mm. the church. So our next question, number nine. How are the agencies of evil combining their forces and consolidating and strengthening themselves for the last great crisis? Isn't that something we should ask? Definitely, because <laughs> you want to know. But we've been told where they're going to operate, right? Yes. So we must know. And if you do this, then what are you likely to be called? <laughs> a conspiracy theorist. Correct, which we have seen as a heretic, right? Yeah. All right. Let's see how they will do this. This comes from letter 114 from 1903. Satan uses the influence of mind on mind. Cast out of heaven, Satan set up his kingdom in this world and ever since he has been untiringly striving to seduce human beings from their allegiance to God. He uses the same power that he used in heaven, the influence of mind on mind. So will there be indoctrination? Definitely. Men become tempters of their fellow men. The strong corrupting sentiments of Satan are cherished and they exert a masterly compelling power under the influence of these sentiments. Men bind up with one another in confederacies, in trade unions and in secret societies. There are at work in the world agencies that God will not much longer tolerate. All right, so now we know how they will set up this secret alliance. They bind themselves up into confederacies, mm -hmm. trade unions, and secret societies. Right? Now, when I started lecturing on secret societies, I received tremendous backlash, mm. largely from within our own ranks and from the leaders within our own ranks. Yeah. This has nothing to do with the message they told me. Mm. And I, I should refrain from speaking about trade unions or secret societies. Mm. This is conspiracy theory. But it is part of the testimony. Yes. And it is part of the Bible because Isaiah clearly warns against the confederacy and the testimonies link it to the secret societies. So in many of the cases when I was told to refrain from speaking on these issues, I would show those verses and say, now who must I obey? All right, Martin, so let us show how celebrities are being used and people are being used to influence mind upon mind. Correct. All right. Hey, COVID, you're gone. I'm going back home to see my mom. Hey, COVID, check this out. We're getting immunity. If enough of us do our part by getting vaccinated, that ripple can become a wave. My name is Elton John. Beautiful cut there. The more people in society that get vaccinated, the more chance there is of eradicating the national COVID pandemic. I've just had a vaccine for COVID. It didn't hurt. I want to go back to work and I want to be able to move around. To visit with Michelle's mom, the hug her and see her on her birthday. I'll be seeing you. I'll be looking at the moon and I'll be seeing you. Find out when you can arm yourself and book your vaccination. Look at some numbers. BTS brings $3.6 billion into South Korea every year through concerts, licensing, merchandise. 
They also attract 800,000 tourists every year. That's around 7% of all arrivals. Imagine their pull. Even the United Nations is not immune. Apparently, they requested President Moon to bring BTS along. The UN did. They said the band would represent global youth. It's becoming a common request for the president. Everywhere he goes, they want him to bring BTS along. In fact, the band has visited the UN before in 2018. Their leader spoke at UNICEF. Last year, they sent a pre-recorded message. They asked young people to overcome the challenges of the pandemic and pursue their dreams. This year, they'll return again, not as guests, but as special diplomatic envoys. It's a soft power coup for, Saudi, uh, for South Korea. BTS and their fans can change the pulse of the internet. They even managed to beat Chinese state media. And that's no easy task. I'll tell you what happened. Last year, BTS paid a tribute to American soldiers of the Korean War. The Chinese press was livid. How dare they not mention the Chinese soldiers? Global Times punched out op-eds. They slammed BTS for its quote-unquote one-sided attitude. All the outrage lasted two days. BTS fans flooded social media with hashtags and tweets. Global Times was outgunned. They started deleting articles from their website. BTS won, Global Times zero. The point is, celebrities can be great diplomatic tools. They have visibility, they have massive following, and people listen when they speak. Something that normal diplomats find hard to achieve. It's also a big win for the United Nations. Put BTS on and more kids will be interested. They don't want to hear Joe Biden talk about climate change. I'm being honest. They would much rather hear BTS talk about it. Uh, the reason why we showed that is to show the influence of mind upon mind, right? Correct. That's One of the tools in his toolbox. Yeah. Here's a statement from Darkness Before Dawn. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. In the soon coming conflict, we shall see exemplified the prophet's words. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you look at these things in the prophetic light, yeah. then you are actually compelled to put them into the prophetic sequence. That's it. You, you cannot do any other. If you do so, there will always be those that shout. Yes. Conspiracy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we just take that BTS video that we've just watched, the Chinese news media gave in to the popular demand of the supporters of BTS and Correct. took off their things. Absolutely. So it's happening you can see this happening in the world. This is the influence of mind upon mind. So it's not only the popular people in the world, but the beast power through his representative is also using the power of mind upon mind. And the whole world wondered after mm -hmm. him, right? Gracias a Dios y el trabajo de muchos. Hoy tenemos vacunas para protegernos del COVID-19. Ellas traen esperanza para acabar la pandemia, pero solo si están disponibles para todos y si colaboramos unos con otros. Vacunarse con vacunas autorizadas por las autoridades competentes es un acto de amor. Y ayudar a que la mayoría de la gente lo haga es un acto de amor. Amor a uno mismo, amor a los familiares y amigos, amor a todos los pueblos. El amor es también social y político. Hay amor social y amor político. Es universal, siempre desbordante de pequeños gestos de caridad personal capaces de transformar y mejorar las sociedades. Vacunarse es un modo sencillo pero profundo de promover el bien común y de cuidarnos unos a otros, especialmente los más vulnerables. 
it's interesting that all of these great celebrities that according to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy are not on the right side when it comes to adhering to the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? They seem to be free from many of the rules and regulations that apply to others. And they even mock about it. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look at that. The L.A. County Department of Health is responding after Seth Rogen called out the Primetime Emmy Awards for not abiding by COVID health and safety protocols. Let me start by saying there is way too many of us in this little room. <laughs> what are we doing? They said this was outdoors. It's not. <laughs> they lied to us. We're in a hermetically sealed tent right now. <laughs> I would not have come to this. <laughs> Why is there a roof? I went from wiping my groceries to having Paul Bettany sneeze in my face. So, <laughs> that's a big week. Yeah, it's interesting if you, like you mentioned, certain rules only apply to certain people. Mm -hmm. So, just to come back to the video that we showed of the Pope. If the beast is speaking in a certain manner and the world wonders after it, then we should be very careful, shouldn't we? Uh, it's just something that I continually see the Bible warns against. So, Martin, when it comes to these confederacies of evil that are combining their forces, let's just read another statement. And this one comes from Manuscripts 139. All need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity that figures so largely in the winding up of this earth's history. If you do this, you can get into big trouble, even within the ranks of the church. Yes. God's presentation of the detestable works of the inhabitants of the ruling powers of the world who bind themselves into secret societies and confederacies not honoring the law of God, should enable the people who have the light of truth to keep clear of these evils. That's pretty straightforward. Yes, it should help you to see this. It shouldn't be ostracized. It shouldn't be demonized. Yeah. You should look at it. In fact, you have an instruction yeah. to look at it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. More and more will all false religionists of the world manifest their evil doings, for there are but two parties, those who keep the commandments of God and those who war against God's holy law. Only two parties. So when the ruling powers that are working together with the beast and the false prophet use the celebrities of the world to further an agenda, they are working in confederacy. That's it. Huh? There's, yeah, no, there's, there's no, no doubt about yeah. it. Genesis 6 verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his hearts were only evil continually. Mm. This is the situation in the world. Yes. Now, I have been told on many occasions, not to speak about secret societies mm. because they have nothing to do with our present situation. Mm -hmm. And I've been told that uh, this is conspiracy and I must stay out of it. And I said, this is not a conspiracy, this is a fact. Yeah. These people are involved, the kings of the world, mm -hmm. the celebrities of the world, and the religious leaders of the world mm -hmm. are involved in secret societies such as Freemasonry and the occult, whether we like it or not. Yes. I've been told categorically by high-ranking officials within our own organization that this is not the case. It is pure conjecture. It's mm -hmm. conspiracy. Well, I don't know how blind some people can actually be, but... Uh, just for clarity, we'll show a video just to show how associated these people are. And if you want to put them all in the waste paper basket and say, this doesn't exist, 
then you are like an ostrich that put its head in the sand, which, by the, su- by the way, is also a conspiracy because it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here is a compilation of secret societies and their symbols and signs and who is associated with them. And uh, let's just run through it. And here you have the illustrations of the secret handshakes. Look familiar? And this is the sign of the master of the second veil. See? Purely Masonic. You don't pick this stuff up off the street. Now this is how it's generally executed in the public arena. So when you see this, or this, you know for certain where it comes from and who they belong to. Look at Kramer on the front page of the privately circulated Freemason magazine. Officially a Mason, like fellow brother Tony Abbott, and he's doing this. Now, Martin, do you see or are some so blind that they will not see? There's no one as blind as the one who doesn't want to see. Okay, so we could carry on with the kings of the world, 
and their affiliations to societies, Nelson Mandela, Thabo Mbeki, whoever you want to talk about, they're all involved in this situation. So, shall we have a look at uh, some of the interesting statements that come out that have codes within them? Questions and I, they're all legit. I'm telling you, we're going to get this done. When? It doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter whether it's in six minutes, six days, or six weeks. We're going to get it done. Why is it in So again, 666 is, of course, pure coincidence. Mm -hmm. And Greta Thunberg with her one eye covered, and there are numerous pictures with the same theme. And it's always the same press organizations that take the pictures and post them, etc., etc. Are they binding themselves in secret societies? Yes, and confederating. And confederating. Are there religious leaders that belong to the Freemasons? Yes. Yes, they are there whether we like it or not. They belong to a confederacy of evil and they have no right in God's church, where the law and the testimony is paramount. But the fact of the matter is that we find these people everywhere. And also important to realize is the causes that they stand for is part of this. Then you must be very weary of the cause, because it is part of the cause of the confederacy of evil. A power from beneath is working to bring about the last great scenes in the drama. Satan coming as Christ and working with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those who are binding themselves together in secret societies. I've been told that secret societies have nothing to do with the Bible. Now, if you, if you do a search on the spirit of prophecy... Mm on secret societies, you will get so many quotes, you won't know how to deal with them. But you, you can put into the search engine secret societies mm -hmm. and you get a whole host. Then you put secret society, you get a whole host. You put in Freemasons, one word, you get a whole host. You put in Freemasons, two words, you get a whole host. You put in free, two words, Mason, leaving the S out, you get another lot. So there are hundreds of statements mm -hmm. on this issue, and it has nothing to do with end times. That is so ridiculous that it boggles the mind that intelligent people cannot see it and want to put it into a category mm -hmm. of uh, conspiracy theories. There's a, a reason why. You're either denying it or you're part of it. That's the only solution. You're either denying it because you're ignorant mm -hmm. or you don't want to, want to hear it, or maybe you're part of it. Much of the matter I had read related to the Echo Office and its management from the beginning. The Lord also revealed to me Brother Falkhead's connection with the Freemasons. And I plainly stated that unless he severed every tie that bound him to these associations, he would lose his soul. Is it a serious matter? Yes, you can lose your soul. Have we got an injunction to preach the word to a fallen world and to say that Babylon is fallen? Yes. Is the dragon part of the Babylonian confederacy? Mm. Did we see in the videos that we just showed that the kings of the world are part of this confederacy and part of the secret societies, mm -hmm. that many of the leaders are part of it, that the religious leaders are involved in this? Mm -hmm. And uh, that doesn't mean that they are all are, but this confederacy has come even into the church. Mm. And unless you sever... And here she mentions the Freemasons by name, mm. your connections, you will lose your soul. It is the opposite of the road to salvation. Concerning Israel, the Lord declared the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned amongst the nations. 
Numbers 23, verse 9. To us, as well as to ancient Israel, these words apply. God's people are to stand alone. They are not to join in any secret society or any other worldly confederacy. That includes the ecumenical council. Correct. Everything. Yes. Mm -hmm. The observance of the seventh day Sabbath is to be a sign between them and God showing that they are his people. They are never to forget that they are to be a peculiar people separate from the world inhabitant practice. Through them God will work to gather from all nationalities of people for himself. This warning has to go to the whole world, mm -hmm. but it also goes to the church. It's the most important to the church at this stage. Yes. Because the church is the, one, the arbiter of the truth. Correct. And if there are members in the church or even leaders in the church that are involved in worldly confederacy mm -hmm. or, God forbid, secret societies, then shouldn't they be warned that they will lose their souls if they continue in this particular direction? That brings us to another question. Question number 10. Can we thus put our faith in the rich and famous and the mighty men of power and can the world save us? Never. Never, right? Between the two, a great gulf is fixed, right? That's it. So I cannot put my faith in what the rich and famous are telling me to do. Correct. They belong to secret societies. Mm -hmm. They are being used by the powers that be to manipulate minds. They will use young bands and dress them in suits. Mm -hmm. They did exactly the same thing to the Beatles. Yes. When the Beatles first started out, they were all in their little black suits mm -hmm. and their little ties. And only later, when the people had become accustomed to this fancy mm -hmm. dress, did they change into their Sergeant Pepper attire. And bring, brought in the whole Eastern religion. And the drugs and everything that goes along with it. That is how it starts. So nothing has changed under the sun. I cannot listen to the rich and famous. Unless, of course, the rich and famous come to a realization that the word is truth and separate themselves from these societies. But then, unfortunately, he won't be speaking there anymore. Correct. Now, that video that we showed was actually one of the rich and famous that came out mm -hmm. and said that his life is in danger because he is willing to warn humanity because he has discovered something better in the Word exactly. of God. He was part of that confederacy and stuff. Correct. Yes. And then he came out because realized Correct. this is not... And it's true. interesting that those that tell me that I mustn't speak about these issues don't know that I was associated with these mm -hmm. things through my circumstances and that it is incomprehensible to me that they are so blind as to say it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Revelation 6.15 And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondsman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. It's a very interesting verse, right? It's got the mighty men. It's got the chief captains. It's got the bondsmen and it's got the free man. Yeah, it's got actually all of society. Yeah, it even has the Freemasons in there. <laughs> <laughs> they will hide themselves. Mm. Verse 18 says that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Martin, majority, no matter how much power is behind them is not in the right relationship to the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Bottom line. That's it. And if we look at those questions so far, where are we in the stream of time? Are these things unfolding? Are these confederacies being formed? Do we see them joining up with those three powers of Babylon? Mm -hmm. If you cannot see it, there's a problem. So what are the responsibilities and duties of God's people? 
And this is how important? Because if you now realize, okay, we are at the end. We are busy running towards the finishing line. Yes. Then everybody's ears should prick up now. We should be so attentive. The banner of truth and religious liberty held aloft by the founders of the gospel church and by God's witnesses during the centuries that have passed since has in this last conflict been committed to our hands. The responsibility for this great gift rests with those whom God has blessed with the knowledge of his word. We are to receive this word as a supreme authority. That sets the groundwork, right? We are to recognize human government as an ordinance of divine appointment and teach obedience to its sacred duty within its legitimate sphere. Yeah. But when its claims conflict with the claims of God, we must obey God rather than men. God's word must be recognized as above all human legislation. A thus says the Lord is not to be set aside for a thus says the church or a thus says the state. The crown of Christ is to be lifted above the diadems of earthly potentates. That's pretty clear. That's it. So this is our duty. This is our duty within the church. And it's important to start realizing when the church and government are speaking against God. Correct. And sometimes it is necessary to speak the truth, even if it goes counter to what some are saying. Mm -hmm. That brings us to the next question. What happened to the mighty men of the past ages that opposed the will of God? And what will happen to the final opposers of his will? I think everybody should realize that that's a pretty rhetorical question. But uh, let's just have a look at some of them. Cain, Nimrod, the Assyrians, the empires of Daniel 7, and the man of sin. What will be and what was their situation and their demise second thessalonians 2 3 let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition martin have we bent over backwards to try and reveal what they are doing who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God? What about Revelation 19.20? And the beast was taken. And with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. This is a very serious issue. Definitely. That's, we started off with what will be the outcome. Death. Here it's acknowledged. Eternal death. I, I cannot dare be associated with them. I might have a peaceful time on earth, mm -hmm. but I will have lost eternity. So let me ask some miscellaneous questions. In other words, there are so many questions. We've been asking them all through this presentation. But let's just put some questions within this question. We're dealing with the kings of the world and the, and the mighty men and the rulers and the empires. Let me ask, were there good kings in Israel in the northern kingdom? No. The Bible doesn't mention one, right? It's a very sad state of affairs. Not one. Were there good kings in the kingdom of Judah? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there were faithful kings. Correct. So were they in the majority or in the minority? Unfortunately, the minority. Okay. Were there good kings that became bad kings? Yes. Were there bad kings that became good kings? Yes. Fortunately, yes. Mm -hmm. So this is a battle between good and evil. Correct. Were there good kings that became bad kings that became good kings? Yes. <laughs> Solomon, right? Yes, Solomon. 
Now, this is very interesting because we can draw a lot of typologies out of this because we are told that we are repeating the history of Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're bringing this back to the church. I'm bringing this back to the church. So let's ask another question then. Question number 12. Generally speaking, did the majority of these kings tend towards godliness or towards apostasy? Unfortunately, apostasy. The majority of the kings tended towards apostasy. But they were kings of Israel, weren't they? Yes. Second Chronicles 36, 16 says, But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and misused his prophets. Until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. If that's a typology, then it's a pretty sad typology, right? Second Timothy 3.13 But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Nobody needs to be deceived because yeah. we have the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Right? It has been foretold on how to look out to not being deceived. Okay. okay that brings us to another question. Is the history of redemption written in the lives of the first three kings of Israel? Is yes. that a possible typology? Yep. Okay. Could King Saul represent the fall? King David, a type of the Messiah and the plan of redemption? And King Solomon, a type of the church? Well, we're stretching it now. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I thought it would be interesting to speculate on this issue. If this can be brought into harmony with the word and the testimony, then we know we're on the right track. All right. So maybe you have this interesting typology here. Saul is the one that literally goes into open rebellion and eventually consults the witch of Endor, right? Mm -hmm. King David has many, many faults like all of us. But he is nevertheless the type of Messiah and the plan of redemption is beautifully typified in him. Mm. He who fell and who was raised up again by the grace of God. And then King Solomon as a type of the church. Let's look at that one in a little bit more detail. Well, 2 Samuel 5 verse 4 says, David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 40 years. So, David was 30 when he started, and there are so many parallels, messianic parallels, mm -hmm. where he is a type of the Messiah, right? And Jesus also started his ministry when he was 30 years old. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 42. And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. Now Solomon is a type of the church. Solomon built the temple. Then he desecrated the temple. And then finally he declared the whole duty of man representing the final message of the church to humanity. Mm. Because he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So he gone through the entire gambit. Yep. He started off a good king and he built the temple. I will raise up this temple, said Jesus. Mm. And the temple is his body, and the, his body is his church, right? Yes. Then he desecrated the temple. Mm -hmm. And then he said the whole duty is the law and the testimony. So he put it right again. He put it right again. So here's another question. On which portion of Solomon's reign does Freemasonry base its belief system? On the good king or the bad king portion? It has to be on the bad portion. Well, obviously, because they're a confederacy of evil, right? Exactly. Solomon put Chemosh into the temple. Mm -hmm. They used to sacrifice human beings to him. We won't go into those oh. sordid details. Okay, let's have a look at uh, some Freemason sources. This is Manly Palmer Hall, Freemason of the 33rd degree of Freemasonry, as quoted in his book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, page 63. And it deals with the word Solomon. 
and it's actually an acronym, Sol Om Om. And he writes, he, the true Mason, realizes that the Temple of Solomon is really the Temple of the Solar Man, Sol Om Om, the King of the Universe. That's Lucifer, the sun god. Here is a, a book, Scarlet and the Beast, by John Daniels, and he says the name Sol Om On, we know, is the composite name of three sun gods in Roman, Indian, and Egyptian mythology. They school their rituals on the portion of Solomon's reign mm -hmm. that has to do with his state of apostasy. Yeah. It's rather sad, right? Mm -hmm. And they enshrine Lucifer as the true son of God. Yeah. Another question. Question number 15. Where can we expect the battle between good and evil to rage the strongest? Don't answer it. Let's, let's put it on the screen. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So I can assume that the battle between good and evil rages in the heart of every individual that has been born since the time of Adam. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And we all go through it. Everybody. Nobody yeah. is free from this nobody nobody is free from this battle you cannot say i have arrived mm. and i don't have a battle we all have this battle and we have to fight it daily and the old man of sin that evil one has to be bludgeoned to death every mm -hmm. single day so i think we can say the battle between good and evil rages in the heart right mm -hmm. But then we also hear in Revelation 12, 17 that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the church. Now if the dragon is wroth with her and he makes war with her, then can we expect the battle to rage within her? It has to. This it has to. Is right? un undoubtedly. Okay. Now we clearly stated in the last one that even if you find evil raging within the church, does that make the church Babylon? No. 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 Definitely not, right? So we have to be very mm. sure on that issue. So let's read from the Great Controversy from the 88th edition, page 510. From the days of Adam to our own time, our great enemy has been exercising his power to oppress and destroy he is now preparing for his last campaign against the church. All who seek to follow Jesus will be brought into conflict with this relentless foe. The more nearly the Christian imitates the divine pattern, the more surely will he make himself a mark of the attacks of Satan. All, right? mm -hmm. All who are actively engaged in the cause of God seeking to unveil the deceptions of the evil one and to present Christ before the people, will be able to join in the testimony of Paul, in which he speaks of serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations. So within the church, you can expect a lot of opposition, especially if you want to unveil the deceptions of the evil one. Yes then you can expect opposition. opposition. Hmm? Mm -hmm. That's a very serious statement. Yeah, well, it's a very true statement. Unfortunately, it is a very true statement. That brings us to the next question. Has the apostate church persecuted God's people throughout the ages, and what should we learn from this? Well, the apostate church, we're referring to the church of the Middle Ages, right? With, to, the, to the beast system. Has it persecuted God's people? Yes, unrelentlessly. And should we learn from this? If you don't learn from it, you will surely repeat it. That's a very, very sad statement. All right. Historically, is this so? This comes from History of the Rise and Influence of the Spirit of Rationalism in Europe, Volume 2, page 32. 
that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed amongst mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. The memorials indeed of many of her persecutions are now so scanty that it is impossible to form a complete conception of the multitude of her victims. And it is quite certain that no power of imagination can adequately realize their sufferings. That's history. She has persecuted and she is responsible for the blood of millions upon millions and mm. millions of God's people. No doubt about it. Here's a quote, and you can find it on the webpage EGW Writings. And the following quotes are from the book Facts of Faith by Christian Edwardson. A persecuting power. The little horn was also to wear out the saints of the Most High, Daniel 7.25. That is, it was to persecute them till they were literally worn out. Has the papacy fulfilled this part of the prophecy? In order to do Roman Catholics no injustice, we shall quote from unquestioned authorities among them. And since they persecute people for heresy, we must first let them define what they mean by heresy. In the New Catholic Dictionary published by the Universal Knowledge Foundation, a Roman Catholic institution, we read, Heresy, heresis, choice, deciding for oneself what one shall believe and practice. According to this definition, anyone who will not blindly submit to papal authority but will read the Bible, deciding for himself what he shall believe is a heretic. What official stand has the Catholic Church taken in regard to such heretics? This we find stated in the Catholic Encyclopedia in the following words. In the bull Ad Extirpanda, Innocent the Fourth says, When those adjudged guilty of heresy have been given up to the civil power by the bishop or his representative or the Inquisition, the Podesta or chief magistrate of the city shall take them at once and shall within five days at the most execute the laws made against them. Nor could any doubt remain as to what civil regulations were meant. For the passages were ordered, the burning of impenitent heretics were inserted in the papal decretals from the imperial constitutions. And then it mentions them. So they say they persecuted yeah. to death. It carries on. The aforesaid bull, ad extirpanda, remained thenceforth the fundamental document of the Inquisition, renewed or reinforced by several popes, and mentions Alexander and Clement and Nicholas and Bonifates and others. The civil authorities therefore were enjoyed by the popes under pain of excommunication to execute the legal sentences that condemned impenitent heretics to the stake. It is to be noted that excommunication itself was no trifle. For if the person excommunicated did not free himself from excommunication within a year, he was held by the legislation of that period to be a heretic and incurred all the penalties that affected heresy. So they didn't only excommunicate you, throw you out of the no. church, hmm. they killed you. killed you. This encyclopedia was printed in 1910 and bears the sanction of the Catholic authorities and of their censor, so that here is up-to-date authority showing that the Romish church sanctions persecution. Hmm. They cannot divorce themselves from their history. All right, let's get a little bit closer. Question number 17. Is it only the apostate church of the Middle Ages that has persecuted God's children? Or did God's people of old persecute his children? Did the Protestant churches persecute God's children? Was it only Rome? Did God's people in, in the Old Testament mm -hmm. persecute God's people? Yes. Isn't it interesting that in the time of Ahab, who is married to Jezebel, mm -hmm. and Jezebel serves as a type of the church of the Middle Ages, persecuted God's people? Yeah. 
But you know what's interesting with that story? Even while this persecution was going on, there were leaders within his court that hid God's prophets, his preachers, in other words, in groups of 50s in, mm-hmm, ca- mm-hmm. in caves and fed them from the money supply of the king's table. So God's people were still supported by the finances of the king within the church, it's in amazing. other words. It's amazing. That is very important to, very to important. emphasize. And while you've got this blatant apostate leader, the rest of that church are still supported. Correct. In that situation. I, I don't know how far we should take that typology, but it's interesting. So we can say for sure that it's not only the church of the Middle Ages that persecuted God's children. God's church persecuted God's children. And the Protestant churches persecuted God's children. Let's see how God feels about this. In Zechariah 7 verse 9 and onwards it says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken, and pulled away the shoulder, and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made the hearts of an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law, and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets, Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Can we see we have the same issue? They turned their ear from the law and the words. In other words, the law and the testimony. Therefore it came to pass that he cried and they would not hear. So they cried and I would not hear, says the Lord of hosts. How long halt ye between two opinions? Testimonies for the church, volume 3. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Not one of that vast assembly dared utter one word for God and show his loyalty to, to Jehovah. So how did this situation come about? Because this is really a typological story of how the prophets of Baal with in and the prophets of Ashtoreth within the church will eventually come to their demise. And it's interesting that the Elijah message has a lot to do with it. Testimonies to the church, volume 3. What astonishing deception and fearful blindness had like a dark cloud covered Israel. This blindness and apostasy had not closed about them suddenly. It had come upon them gradually as they had not heeded the word of reproof and warning which the Lord had sent to them because of their pride and their sins. And now in this fearful crisis, in the presence of the idolatrous priests and apostate king, they remained neutral. If God abhors one sin above another of which his people are guilty, it is doing nothing in case of an emergency. Indifference and neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. So we cannot remain neutral. You have to take a stand. We cannot remain silent. You're either with the prophets of Baal or you're with God's people. And this was pertaining to God's church. Correct. Let's have a look at some historic sources and just make sure about this persecution issue. This comes from courses, lumenlearning.com, and it talks about persecution. Roman Catholics and Protestants alike persecuted the Anabaptists, resorting to torture and execution in attempts to curb the growth of the movement. The Protestants and the Zwingli were the first to persecute the Anabaptists with fairly months becoming the first martyr in 1527. 
On May 20, 1527, Roman Catholic authorities executed Michael Sattler. King Ferdinand declared drowning, called the third baptism, the best antidote to anabaptism. So did the kings of the world and the church persecute? Yes. And we're dealing with Protestant churches yes. and Catholic churches. The Tudor regime, even the Protestant monarchs, Edward VI of England and Elizabeth I of England, persecuted Anabaptists as they were deemed too radical and therefore a danger to religious stability. The persecution of Anabaptists was condoned by ancient laws of Theodosius I and Justinian I that were passed against the Donatists which decreed the death penalty for any who practiced rebaptism. Martyr's Mirror by Thielman describes the persecution and execution of thousands of Anabaptists in various parts of Europe between 1525 and 1660. Continuing persecutions in Europe was largely responsible for the mass emigration to North America by Amish, Hutterites and Mennonites. So persecution has been the name of the game throughout the centuries. Mm -hmm. If you don't agree, then you are done away with. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's papal or Protestant. Now, irrespective of the issues surrounding the Anabaptists, whether they had fanatical views or not, the fact of the matter is why they were persecuted is because of adult baptism. Mm. Is it biblical? Yes. So were they actually sentenced to death because they believed the word? Yes. Okay. What about the Amish and the Mennonites? Irrespective of what their other views are, they were persecuted because they came into conflict with the church, even though many of their doctrines were biblical. Yeah. In fact, James Madison, born in Port Conway, Virginia, the United States, was one of the presidents of the United States, said the purpose of separation of church and state is to keep forever from these shores the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe in blood for centuries. So this is a war that has been raging for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. I'm almost afraid to ask the next question. But before we get there, let's read one more statement. In every generation, God has sent his servants to rebuke sin, both in the world and in the church. But the people desire smooth things spoken to them, and the pure unvarnished truth is not acceptable. Many reformers, in entering upon their work, determined to exercise great prudence in attacking the sins of the church. And the nation, they hope by example of a pure Christian life to lead the people back to the doctrines of the Bible. But the Spirit of God came upon them as they came upon Elijah and they could not refrain from preaching the plain utterances of the Bible doctrines which they had been reluctant to present. They were impelled to zealously declare the truth and the danger which threatened souls. The words which the Lord gave them, they uttered fearless of consequences and the people were compelled to hear the warning. So this is the situation that we are in. Today. We need to say what God impresses upon our minds, even if it brings us into conflict, yes. right? Like we've read in an early, the earlier statement, God abhors neutrality in a time of crisis. Correct. All right, this is the question that I'm almost afraid to ask. Has the remnant church always dealt kindly with God's children? Has it dealt kindly with God's prophets and his messengers through the ages? And will the remnant possibly even persecute God's children in the end? Now, when I talk about the remnant, I'm talking about the church as a whole. But, uh, of course, there are all kinds of fish within this church. And we cannot call the church Babylon, even though some of the fish might not actually belong into the gospel net. How do we know that they don't belong into the gospel net? Because they don't believe the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, right? Yes. That's the criterion. So 
let us be very careful and not turn our weapons against the mm -hmm. church militant. But the fact of the matter is, they haven't always dealt kindly with God's children, nor have they dealt kindly with God's prophets. It's important to, we want to uplift the church. We want to get this church because it has to take the message out to the world. To the fi This is the final church. Absolutely, and it, it is the final message of warning. It is the apple of its eye. And if something needs to take place to wake it up, exactly. then it has to be said, right? So let's ask ourselves, how did the church, that means members in the church and leaders in the church, how did they treat James White? Read Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1. They treated him like the early church treated Paul. Yeah. And sent him to an early grave. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. How did they treat Ellen White? They even banned her to Australia. And they wrote the most horrendous mm -hmm. things against her. And she met with so much coldness that she was so perplexed at times that... Uh, her pen could hardly pen the anguish, right? So when James White and Ellen White preached to the church, particularly about their faults, their reception wasn't exactly rosy. No. Right? Can we say that? All right. How did they treat Hannah Moore? That's a very sad story. It's a very sad story, right? That she had to die separated from those that she felt an affiliation to. Long to be with. Long to be with them. Letters were written even by pastors of other denominations. And uh, it's just unbelievable how they treated Hannah Moore. How did they treat Jones and Wagner? Not very kindly. Not very kindly, right? So whenever somebody got up and spoke the truth, like James White or Alan White, then they were faced with a fair amount of wrath. No. And Jones and Wagner, well, mm. they were driven to the point where they virtually gave up, right? Mm. How did they treat B.G. Wilkinson? Well, not very differently. Not very differently. B.G. Wilkinson, I mean, if you read his, his writings, mm -hmm. Truth Triumphant. Yeah. What a magnificent book, right? Our authorized version vindicated. He was actually one of the first to write on this issue. Mm -hmm. He actually set the gold standard yes. and started this debate. And you know what? I'm so proud that this debate started within this remnant denomination. Where else could it start? God used Alan White. God used Jones and Wagner. And I believe God. God used B.G. Wilkinson. And the spirit of prophecy bears out what he did. Mm -hmm. But they treated him very unkindly. And in fact, it is only after his death that his answers to objections was published. Yeah. And to this day, the war is raging about what he wrote, right? Uh, how did they treat Gerhard Hasel? I met Gerhard Hasel personally and I very fondly remember that we went and sat under a tree at uh, our college in South Africa and there we sat and chatted and uh, we had such a good conversation that he <laughs> forgot his... <laughs> his next appointment, so we had to rush because he was late for that. But then he came to my home and uh, we had lunch together and we chatted some more. And later on, I heard the very sad story about how he was often treated uh, by one of his very, very close associates. Mm -hmm. First hand, not second hand. But I want to say, if it weren't for Gerard Hasel, I don't know whether our theology would be so beautifully packaged as it is. 
And how do they treat some of our modern day medical missionaries and evangelists? You know what? It is with much sadness that I sometimes see how they treat these people. Now, let's be fair. Some of our modern day medical missionaries and evangelists, you know, might not always have it absolutely spot on. Mm. But they sacrifice time, convenience, family, mm -hmm. spend time away from home, Luxury. sleep on floors mm. sometimes. I mean, they accuse them of money grabbing. They accuse they accused me of that too. You've been at the other end to of the To my that. face, they accused me of doing this for money. And the irony is <laughs> they accused me of doing it for money when I just sold my car and my wife had to walk so that I could go and continue the work. But uh, they did the same to Ellen White. What about our, some of our medical missionary workers that spend their lives bringing the message of salvation through television stations, risking their lives taking medication to people, spending times in jail for the sake of the gospel. It's so easy, Martin, when you sit at a, at a desk in some fancy office to run these people down, even if, they, even if they make a mistake here or there. But when you study their characters and you look at their zeal, I look at some of the medical people that work under such difficult circumstances to bring alternative healing methods mm. to the people, how they are treated sometimes and how they are ostracized and run down. It is a very, very sad state of affairs. So what can we expect in the future? Second Timothy 3 verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But I want to say to our missionaries, mm -hmm. I want to say to our evangelists, I want to say to our people that work in the jungles, that take the health message to the poor and those that cannot afford to be helped, I want to say to them, don't lose courage. It happened in the past to the prophets of God. How was Elijah treated? No different. No different. Look at how Ellen White was treated. Look at how Hannah Moore was treated. Mm. Look at how Jones and Wagner was treated. Look at how Wilkinson was treated. How Hazel was treated. And uh, should we expect less? But there are so many that appreciate it. Mm. There are so many that stand for truth and righteousness within this church. This is God's church. And even if there are people... Mm that will want to persecute those that preach the message. There are many, many more that love the truth. And their lights will shine brightly when the time comes. But sadly, we are told in selected messages that we have far more to fear from within than from without. The hindrances to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. Unbelievers have a right to expect that those who profess to be keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will do more than any other class to promote and honor by their consistent lives, by their godly example and their active influence the cause which they represent. But how often have the professed advocates of the truth proved the greatest obstacle to its advancement. This is not us speaking. No. This is the spirit of prophecy. God. God speaking, speaking through to, the spirit of prophecy yeah. to tell the church, be careful. Be careful. The unbelief indulged, the doubts expressed, the darkness cherished, encourage the presence of evil angels and open the way for the accomplishment of Satan's devices. Irrespective, this is the apple of his eye, the only object on which he pours out his supreme regard. The work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, 
she will have to do in a terrible crisis. And the most discouraging, forbidding circumstances, the warnings that the worldly conformity has silenced or withheld, must be given under the fiercest opposition from the enemies of the faith. Martin, if you in these days stand up mm -hmm. and deliver a message on behalf of the three angels' messages, you will experience opposition, not only from without, but also from, from within. within. And at that time, the superficial conservative class whose influence has steadily retarded the progress of the work will renounce the faith and take their stand with their avowed enemies towards whom their sympathies have long been tending. These apostates will then manifest the most bitter enmity, doing all in their power to oppress and malign their former brethren and to excite indignation against them. Let me put it bluntly. Mm. They are not really of the church. No, they're of the world. They're in the church, mm -hmm. but they're not of the church. And they will become the most bitterest enemies of those who preach the three angels' messages. And their influence has been increasing, but they will renounce the faith. They will take their stand with the world to whom their sympathies have been tending for a long, long time already. And this must encourage people in the church. Do not want to leave the church. Absolutely, you don't want to leave it. Now you stand. You stand. I've always said, put super glue yes. on your chair and sit on it. So don't leave this church. No. Let's do what God expects us to do. Let's lift up our voices like a trumpet. This day is just before us. The members of the church will individually be tested and proved. They will be placed in circumstances where they will be forced to bear witness for the truth. If you don't do it willingly, you're going to be forced. Mm -hmm. Many will be called to speak before councils and in courts of justice, perhaps separately and alone. The experience which would have helped them in this emergency, they have neglected to obtain. And their souls are burdened with remorse for wasted opportunities and ne neglected privileges. If you preach this message and you get the opposition, it actually gives you some practice for what is coming. Mm -hmm. In our previous one, we did mention the one where she dreamt about the Catholic procession. That night I dreamed that I was in Battle Creek. Mm -hmm. Now we're not going to read it again, but the fact of the matter is that there was this concept of Catholic ideology within the church, amongst some. And we also showed that the world has no right to doubt true Christianity because they are unworthy members of the church, nor should Christians become disheartened because of these false brethren. Mm -hmm. And then she mentioned Simon Magus and uh, all of those that were involved, even Judas, so that's not a reason to leave the church. Correct. The question is of the church or of the world. We looked at that as well. Mm -hmm. And we saw that those that are of the world, even though they are in the church, can become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. And we also saw that they become a beacon for you not to carry on. Correct. After them. And that they become efficient agents when you come before the courts. Mm. So we can expect some people, even from within the church, to turn against the message. But let's have a word of caution. Matthew 7 verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. Luke 6.37. Judge not and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Or John 7, 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgments. There are many of the church that I might be inclined to consider as enemies of the truth, right? But I'm not supposed to judge. I may not judge the person, but I can judge the deed, right? Yes. So, Judge not the man, but rebuke the deed. Isaiah tells us, cry loud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. 
Show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Because some believe that you shouldn't say anything about these issues. So we don't know who we are dealing with. And this is the example that I always use. Are we dealing with Aaron or are we dealing with Caiaphas? We must leave that for God to decide. Because if I had to judge from appearances, I would definitely condemn Aaron, mm -hmm. who created the golden calf and told them to dance around the golden calf. And I would say, well, Caiaphas is a health reforming, law keeping individual. And I wouldn't know until he crucified the Lord, right? Correct. So do they oppose the message of warning and go along with the popular stream out of fear for their position or fear of ridicule, as did Aaron? Will they go with the popular stream for fear of their lives or because of personal conviction? I don't know. And are they infiltrators or just deceived? Let's leave that to God. Revelation 22:20 20 says, He which testifies these things, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So, Martin, our questions have taken us through the sweep of our prophetic understanding, even to the point of expecting great opposition from within. But that doesn't make this church Babylon. And this church is going through to the kingdom. And the true stars will shine brightly when the darkness increases. So may God in his mercy grant us the courage to speak when we have to. Mm -hmm. And the brotherly love that binds us to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us not judge them as human beings, but let the truth be spoken. Mm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how do we deal with this issue? So many people are looking and saying that they do not agree with this, that, and the other. Let us preach the three angels' messages together. Let us warn against the mark of the beast that is coming let us find solidarity in the three angels' messages because we are allowed to have nothing else to occupy our minds. Thank you that we can be part of a movement that is still lifting its voice in defense of the word and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.